So I think one thing a couple of you have uh, touched on, uh, Janice and David, is uh, David on the PI surplus. And, uh, and Janice, you spoke about uh, experience rating for employers. And uh, uh, I just want to hear, and so does you as well, but uh, to hear your views on EI financing, because many of us are aware, for example, the uh, program historically from 1940 until 1990 was financed by workers, employers, and the state. Uh, in 1990, the federal government uh, announced that they would no longer be contributing to the program. So, um, and a lot of the changes are driven not so much by social pressures anymore, but by the need to balance the account. So I'm just wondering in terms of fiscal responsibility and financing of the program, um, how you see the roles and responsibilities of the three stakeholders. Um, there, there has been some talk lately about employers wanting a 50-50 split of premiums. Currently, workers pay about 43% of the cost of the program, the employers pay the balance. Now there's more of a push by employers to say they want a 50-50 split. So I want to hear your views. How should it be financed? And what are the responsibilities of workers, employers, and the state to help finance the program? Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I think this problem, this uh, issue with the surplus and who owns the surplus, again, comes down to what do we want out of the program. If we're going to say that you know, it's going to be uh, financed by contributions from employers and employees only, and the state you know, can't touch it, you know, you're not going to put anything in, it means you also can't take it all out, uh, then it should be you know, thought of as an insurance program, and then it should be set up as an insurance program uh, aimed to stabilize incomes over you know, when, when a negative shock happens and you're unemployed. That might mean that some people are going to have to pay more. That might mean that some employers are going to have to pay more. If you use the system more, you pay into it more. Um, if you use the system less, you pay less. Um, and, and taking out the government you know, then says, OK, well, you know, if you want to use this as a redistribution, if you want to do things like lower the premiums for small business, which is a redistributive uh, policy, it's not an insurance policy, you can't, you can't do that unless you know you can justify it as being uh, economically efficient for the for the financing. So I think that you know, getting getting that settled, you know, who owns the surplus? Um, and I think even just recently, the government took money out of the surplus to, to balance their budget. Um, and I, I think that you know th that question alone will allow us to say, okay, what type of program this is, and, and who can make those decisions. Well, I think I mean, it would have been better, if we look back on it historically, to take the road that was not taken, that is the road of non-contributory insurance, uh, but that's not the way that things went. So uh, in the current set of circumstances, I think any move to go towards that 50-50 split that um, Neil mentioned, I think would be regressive and should definitely be, be opposed. Um, and again, in terms of what's immediately practical, I think we need to try to resist pressures that would take us in, in that direction. Um, and the prospect of getting the federal government back involved uh, in terms of contributing in the, in the medium run is not very likely. Um, so, at the, you know, I think at the moment, um, I've thought a lot about the, this question, it's an interesting one. Uh, but I think we should see any effort to shift to a 50 50 model in the context of the broader gutting of the program that I tried to outline and see that it's not some isolated question, but would further contribute, I think, to that, uh, to the slant that's been taken. Just let me say one thing briefly. I'd argue uh, that uh, the state has a role in financing because the state benefits uh, when uh, poverty rates are lowered or the duration of poverty is lowered, when uh, inequality is lowered, uh, health care costs will go down uh, because these are drivers of uh, of morbidity uh, for a whole range of diseases. So I think the state is a beneficiary in the sense that uh, their program costs are partially dependent on it, and therefore the state should be a payer. Do you think if the state's a payer, then then they should be able to, you know, if we have a surplus? I mean, this calling the state a payer means that tax, it's coming out of general taxes. So then if we have a surplus, you know, we should just go back into general taxes, which is a big, um, arguments, like, you know, the, so the government should contribute, but 
Can that mean also that they can take out the surplus? And then we'd have to say, should other payers be able to remove surplus? So should workers be able to remove uh, surplus? Um, uh, I'd argue that the principle should be that all payers should be treated similarly. Janet, do you want to weigh in on the, on the uh, maternity benefits? <laughs> I did have a few things to say about maternity. So I'm doing some research right now on the, uh, the effect of the extension of the EI um, program in 2001 on the seasonality of births, which is you know, it's, it's kind of looking at, you know, the, I don't know if you, there's more babies born in December now than there were before the extension of EI, and so we're looking at that and the effect of uh, that could, could affect our, our hockey uh, status in Canada because kids born in December tend to be less. But that's a small, it's just a fun paper. Um, what I did want to say about the, I can't find it, here we go, the maternity and parental benefits. So just a little history. Um, this, this started in 1971. So the EI provides insurance for earnings interruptions. And one of those earnings interruptions that was decided in 1971 is having to leave to have a baby. So in 71, uh, they started with 15 weeks of maternity benefits only. In 1990, there was an additional 10 weeks that was then called parental. So it could be taken by either um, the father or the mother. Uh, but in 1990, that two week the two weeks where you, you waiting the waiting period uh, was was applied twice. So if the mother took it for 15 and then the father took it for 10, he had to also endure the two weeks. So there wasn't a lot of fathers taking it at that time. With the 2001 extension, uh, we went from 10 weeks of parental to 35. So now we have a whole year of parental maternity benefits. The second two week waiting period was waived. Now, I was working at Finance Canada when these um, changes were coming on board, and there was a lot of discussion at that time about how detrimental this extension to the year maternity parental benefits would be for women. Uh, many thought that the firms would be reluctant to hire young women because of the high risk that they would take maternity. So if you had two people show up for your job and one was a 25-year-old man and a 25-year-old woman, um, he has a lot less risk of having to leave, of leaving for a year. Um, whether or not this actually occurred is difficult to say because the program was rolled out uniformly across provinces and so we don't have any variation. So it's actually really hard to tease that out, whether or not it was detrimental to women. Um, the, we have seen that uh, the extension of EI has increased women's labor force participation. Um, one primary reason for this is because women are more likely to return to work after their first child because the benefits of returning to work have increased because now you can uh, become eligible for another year of maternity leave for your second child. So we do see a lot more women um, returning to work and that's actually spaced out the children. So you get more spacing between children. Um, so the policy change that I did want to advocate here that I think we should think about is for the national system to follow the Quebec system and designate a number of weeks for fathers only. Um, the Quebec system has five weeks of per paternity leave. Um, and one way, one reason to do this is to ensure that the discrimination against women in the labor market is not going to be affected by the potential that they might take leave. Because if uh, uh, fathers and mothers are equally likely to take leave, uh, then we're not going to see discrimination against women on this case. Uh, currently, only one in ten eligible fathers take per, uh, parental leave. In Quebec, uh, half do. And in countries like Sweden and Norway, where the benefits are higher, it's 90% that take leave, the, the men that take leave. So I think this would be one um, policy that would certainly help um, labor market discrimination against women and also help equalize work within the households to get more, more men to change diapers, which is quite a goal of the EI system. <laughs> That's what I want to say. I would just like to uh, point out that although the discerning listener might note that there are significant differences in perspective between Janice and myself on a lot of these questions, I'm in fundamental agreement with that last um, suggestion. I think the Quebec example shows us uh, the difference that it can make to have that kind of tailored policy uh, and from a feminist perspective, a gender equity perspective, I think it's really important and it's definitely something that should be changed. What percentage of men take it up in Quebec? 50. Well, 54. Okay. Yeah. 
I think there's an interesting uh, tension that's existed within the program historically, and that's the tension between responding to change or changing labor market conditions as the, the uh, case of uh, adding maternity and parental benefits in the 1970s with increased participation of women in the labor force and pressures to try to influence worker behavior. There always seems to be this historical tension of everybody has new thoughts on that. It seems increasingly we're moving toward the latter and being less responsive. Um, and when I think about an enhancement of some of the benefits, um, and I haven't seen data on this, but it's pretty clear to me, and I don't think I'd have difficulty finding it, that there's a gap between the so-called deserving unemployed or the long-tenured workers, you talk about different classification of workers, and the undeserving unemployed, who tend to be people that work in part-time employment and seasonal industries. I think you'd have trouble finding any data these days. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> any data at all. It's interesting, the, the Mowat Center report argues that about um, half of the decrease was because, because of change in uh, program rules and arrangements, and half of the uh, decrease in take-up uh, among all of the unemployed was due to changes in the labor market, you know, including precarious work, multiple employers, fewer hours. And um, they make the argument not uh, to change the rules for employment insurance back, but to establish a um, parallel program uh, for uh, the uh, for those who no longer qualify for as high benefits, a kind of temporary program uh, with the goal of stopping them from falling onto provincial social assistance rolls. Yeah. 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 Yeah.